So I'm one of Claire's PhD students and I'm working here on dairy heifer calves and over the last three years I've been uh, looking at dairy calves on 12 different farms in the south of the UK but actually that's mostly not what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Mm -hmm. What I was asked to do is to have a hunt around in the literature and try and find some areas perhaps where we do have evidence but that our general practice doesn't maybe match up with that as those might be some areas we can do something about. Um, and also I'm going to start by quickly introducing what are the main problems. So I'm guessing if you're here you've probably seen these numbers before. This is Jessica Brickle, now Jessica Cook's uh, work from the RBC a few years ago looking at the mortality rates on a group of heifers she recruited. And the real take home here is that lots and lots of them die, they die when they're very young and when they're young they die of contagious diseases. And another big slide, so I went around and tried to hunt for all the big cohorts I could find of heifers that have been followed through from around the world. And the key thing to notice here is that none of these are in the UK. And some other points from <coughs> this kind of collection of papers is that diarrhoea and pneumonia are by far the most common problems all the way around the world. So we can guess they are here too. But the prevalence is hugely variable. And whether diarrhoea or pneumonia, which is your main problem, is quite variable around the world. And without doing work in the UK, it would be hard to predict what our problem, our single biggest problems are. The other thing to, from looking at these different studies is that how much disease you think is there really varies a lot depending on who goes and finds it. So these are some numbers, they're from 1996 in America, so they're a bit old, but what they were looking at is farmers compared to vets at spotting disease. So this was recording the treatments that farmers gave compared to sending a vet out to look through all the individual animals. And what they found is that farmers were really good at specificity. If they decided it was diarrhoea or pneumonia, well, they were always right with pneumonia and really right most of the time with diarrhoea. But their sensitivity wasn't so good. They were spotting between half and 60% of those two diseases. So they were missing an awful lot of perhaps the more mild cases of disease or the earlier cases of disease. And that would certainly be backed up by what I've found when I've been going around my farms is that Generally, I'm telling a farmer I found a sick calf rather than the farmer telling me that they've treated a calf already. So I think that this could be a similar problem in the UK. So here's some of my data from my 12 farms. So these are from October 2011 till two weeks ago we finished. And what we found is that we had 7.8 cases of diarrhoea per 100 calves at risk and 10.1 cases of pneumonia. So when you turn up each time, you don't necessarily see that many sick calves. But when I started adding that up over time, what I realised was actually very nearly half of my calves got diarrhoea and 46.5% got pneumonia. And just to kind of put those in some perspective, that's absolutely the very most pneumonia of any paper I've read from around the world and the second most diarrhoea to um, a group where they recruited farms that had a diarrhoea problem. So around the world, we do seem to have a lot of disease. And I was recording it in a pretty similar way to how it was being done in these other studies. And maybe if we think about how it is that there's a big problem but we're perhaps missing it, the age distribution might help explain it a little bit. So the diarrheas on my cases were all happening in very young calves and they were over quite quickly. And the pneumonias, so you could miss them because they weren't lasting very long. And the pneumonias were really spread out over the whole period, so perhaps you're missing them because you only get a couple at once and you don't add them up to be a big problem. So we're going to go on now to some perhaps areas where we've drifted from what the evidence is in the literature. And um, so I've been asked to kind of pick holes and find problems. So it's a little bit negative, but hopefully it could be some areas we could improve things. So my first myth is going to be that colostrum can solve every single one of my problems. Everything will be fixed with colostrum and I don't need to do anything else. <coughs> Which I think sometimes might be a bit like the message that we give, but isn't very backed up in the evidence. So if we think about what colostrum can do, it can give passive transfer of antibodies from the cow's blood to her colostrum, the calf eats it into the calf's blood. And that can help reduce the risk of systemic <coughs> animal diseases that go in that whole animal. So good examples are septicemia, pneumonia and joint cell. Here's some results. So for those of you who aren't used to relative risks, what you do there is you compare one group that you give a risk of one, and then if it's a number more than one, they've got more risk. Less than one, they've got less risk. So these are, again, American studies looking at the risk of pneumonia depending on passive transfer. And here they used a cutoff of 12 mg per mil, which is fairly sensible. And they found nearly two and a half times the risk in those that had poor passive transfer. 
And here's an example from some of my studies where um, when they get their ear tags put in, they can heal up nicely, they can get an infection in one ear or both ears. And I check their ears every time, and you can see again there that there's, um, the, the cars with more infections had worse passive transfer. Some other things colostrum can do, provide a really high energy food, and if given over, a f over that first week of life, it can put antibodies in the gut where it might bind up pathogens before they cause diarrhea. But what colostrum can't do is passive transfer cannot put antibodies into the gut. An active immune response creates IgE and there's antibodies at the gut surface. But passive transfer can't do this. And antibodies aren't going to be much help for parasites. And when crypto is one of our most common parasites, that's really worth thinking about. And looking around at all the different studies, passive transfer in itself doesn't seem to be correlated with much of a reduction in diarrhoea. But studies where they feed colostrum throughout the first week of life, and so those antibodies are in the gut, do seem to have quite big differences. The other thing that passive transfer can't do is provide an unlimited uh, number of antibodies forever. It's a single dose, and if you're in a really high-challenge, high-pathogen environment, you can expect those antibodies to be used up and not available for the calf anymore. So I found those results quite surprising. Obviously, everyone knows that the way you present diarrhoea is to look at passive transfer. And so I thought it might be um, good to look at a couple of the studies, and I've got a great long list of them if anyone would like to go look at them as well. So here's a good example. It's quite recent. This is um, 2007 in Canada. And they looked at more than a 1,000 calves, and they went out and took faecal samples. They were really good at spotting it, and they looked at all the calves' passive transfer, and they found no associations. And these are my uh, 482 that I went out and checked the last two years, and we didn't find an association either with passive transfer. OK, next myth, that feeding more liquids makes calves scour. I think a lot of us are quite scared to increase feeding rates. We worry that we'll make calves scour. And there's two reasons that could be. We might worry that we'll give them a nutritional scour. And so here's a couple of, these are both European papers. One of them's from uh, Holland, so really nearby. We could think similar climate, might be similar bugs. And they were looking for the four main pathogens, which probably are familiar to lots of you, Cryptosporidium parvum, rotavirus, coronavirus, and E. coli. And what they found was 80% had either crypto or rotavirus, and only 7% didn't have one of those four. So probably very few have no pathogens at all in these nutritional scours. So they aren't that common. And um, looking, there's a couple of good reviews that have been done over the last year, looking at feeding calves more milk. And what it looks like is that they do have softer, normal feces. So healthy calves have slightly softer feces, but that there's no more cases of proper diarrhea. So if you go around and fecal score, you might see a higher score, but you aren't seeing any more scours. And what these studies are showing is, as a group, that they've got much improved innate immune function and much improved growth rates. So perhaps we don't need to be worrying about this. OK, we're on three out of four now. We're nearly there. So antibiotics in milk are the only solution. It's the only thing I can do. How dare you take them away from me? I feel your pain. Um, I understand why it feels like this could be a really good thing to do. But they have been taken away from us. And we're going to have to do something else instead. So the first thing to think about is, though they might have been something we've fallen back on, how well were they actually working? Should we really mourn this loss, or should we feel excited and do something new? So this is from a couple of different papers, the, the one in Holland I mentioned on the right, and the Canadian one on the left. So this was looking at whether they routinely used prophylaxis in their calves, so treating them in advance of disease, and they found farms that did have more um, diarrhoea, and the other one is whether they routinely treated their diarrhoea with antibiotics, and they got three times as much diarrhoea on those farms. Now, from these studies, we've got no idea of which way the causation is happening. It could plausibly be that we give them more antibiotics, we mess up their gut flora, and they really get more diarrhoea. Or it could be the other way around, that farms with a problem resort to antibiotics, and so lots of antibiotics are getting used on farms that already had lots of disease. But either way, it would suggest they aren't helping very much, these antibiotics. So let's think about what are the alternatives that have been really proven to work. And sort of depressingly, but kind of interestingly, these are very exciting or sexy things. These are really basic things. So every time, these are kind of culled from a few of the big recent studies. And um, every time I've seen them being measured in cohorts, if they measure them sensibly, they come out as being significantly helpful. 
so for example, my favourite quote from a paper today, washing farmers with soap... Washing farmers? <laughs> <laughs> washing feeding equipment with soap. Farmers washing things was what was in my head. Um, <laughs> washing things with soap rather than rinsing them off makes a big difference. They get a third less diarrhoea. Disinfecting floors, having high contamination of the bedding with faeces, a big difference there. Making sure they get fibre from an early age and keeping them in small and stable groups. These things are all proven over loads of different papers to significantly have an effect. Uh, so I think perhaps when we can't go to our crutches, we should go back to what we know works. And I'll, my very last thing, which is that it's all right, I'll cope with BVD, it's a bigger hassle to get rid of it, it's fine, I'll live with it. And this is going to be the only paper where I'm not going to be looking at dairy heifer calves. This is from a feedlot study, and the joy and perhaps the terrible thing about feedlots is they're enormous, and they've got lots and lots of very similar pens all lined up next to each other. And so what they could do here was look at all the pens that had PIs in them, and then all the pens that were next door to a pen with a PI, and then all the pens that were a really long way away and in other areas of the lot. And they can get really big numbers. So we got 3,000, more or less, calves that were sharing with a PI, and nearly 6,000 that were a long way away. And we can look at these different areas. So growth rates, first of all. If you share with a PI, you can grow up 0.55 kilos a day. If you're next door, 0.68. And if you're far away, they're bang on the sorts of targets we're looking for, aren't they? 0.74 kilos a day. And the dollars uh, per kilogram gained, because they did, were weighing them here, so they could do that cost analysis, is really interesting. If you look, again, a scale going through those results. And then if we think about it, so that's perhaps from the farmer's perspective. From the calf's perspective, they're having a rubbish time as well. More than twice as many of them are dying if they're sharing with a PI compared to being a long way away. And then we've got those in the middle. And the treatments per illness. So ideally, if a calf's sick, you give it some medicine and it gets better again. If, but we can all think of those runty animals that require treatment after treatment before they're getting better. And that's a worse position for you paying for all those medicines and a worse position for those calves being ill for a long time. And you can see, again, a nice scale between how close they are to a PI affecting how many times they need to be treated to get better again. And I think that this would be really strong evidence that getting rid of PIs, getting rid of BVD, will reduce that immunosuppression and improve calf health. Mm. So I'm going to just summarise those four areas where I think perhaps there's some evidence that we could be doing things differently. First of all, colostrum. Good passive transfer is obviously a good thing. It improves the calf immune status and helps particularly with diseases like pneumonia. And for feeding colostrum for that whole week, we can put antibodies in the gut to help out with scours. But I think we can't just say, that's the only thing you need to do. You don't need to worry about anything else. I think we need other strategies as well. OK, on to calf scours and liquid feed. I think we can kind of put this to rest a little bit, that we don't need to worry about it. We aren't going to make them scour just by giving them a few more litres of milk. Um, feeding higher volumes is associated with improved innate immune function and improved growth rates and improved productivity right through into lactation. BVD, this is my shortest summary of all. It, <coughs> just do it. Um, eradicating BVD is the best thing to do for the calf's health and welfare and for your finances. And antibiotics in milk, well, they aren't available and they were probably never a good idea at all. And so what we should do instead is rely on things that are proven to work. And these are the perhaps simple but not always easy to do. Being able to have good hygiene requires, you know, have you got warm water and soap at the place where you have your wide L feeders, say, so that it's easy to do rather than having to cart them all around the farm. These having good hygiene and small groups requires really thinking about how you're going to house them, how you're going to set up your buildings, what you're really going to do. Uh, but they are really proven to make a big difference, so perhaps a suggestion mm. that it's worth the effort. That's it. <laughs>